This podcast is brought to you by Aetna. Learn how Aetna is working to build a healthier world by visiting aetnastory.com. Hi, this is Doro. Just a quick reminder before we get to our guest today that the Achieving Optimal Health Conference is on Saturday, October 3rd. Due to the pandemic, this year, the conference will be held virtually, and all are welcome to join. You'll be inspired by luminaries in health and wellness and take home real strategies to improve your happiness and wellness. You can get all the information you need at AchievingOptimalHealthConference.com. And now for the show. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Washingtonian Tracy McWhorter is a writer, speaker, public health nutritionist, and 33-year vegan who's been teaching people how and why to live a healthy vegan lifestyle for the past 30 years. She's the best-selling author of Ageless Vegan and By Any Greens Necessary. Please welcome Tracy McWhorter to Health Gig. Thank you. Why vegan? <laughs> well, I actually became vegan unexpectedly. When I was a sophomore at Amherst College in 1986, our Black Student Union brought Dick Gregory to campus. We knew him as a civil rights icon. We brought him there to talk about the political, economic, social state of Black America. And instead, he decided to talk about the plate of Black America and the politics, economics, culture of that and why he thought that we should be vegetarian. He traced the path of a hamburger from a cow on a factory farm through the slaughterhouse to a fast food restaurant, to a clogged artery, to a heart attack. Ooh. Very graphically. And it just rocked my entire world. I had never heard anything like that before. And I have to say, growing up, my mother was very health conscious. We were omnivores, but we had skim milk, we had whole wheat bread, we had total cereal, we had no cookie jar, no sugar jar, you know. We were, I think, a bit uncommon in that she was health conscious, and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't unfamiliar to me. When I got to Amherst my first year, I gained 25 pounds because I could eat whatever I wanted. So to sit there and hear Dick Gregory talk to us about food, when I thought he was going to talk to us about politics and all of that, which I was very interested in, I felt kind of captive and hoodwinked, you know, but <laughs> it ended up changing my life. You know what? What is the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian? What is the distinction? The thing that they have in common is that they don't eat meat. So a vegetarian does not eat meat, but could eat eggs, milk, cheese, you know, dairy products. A vegan does not eat any products from animals at all. Got it. So was the vegan then a plant-based diet? Yes, both are considered plant-based diet. Both of them. So it's almost plant-based diet and underneath that is vegan and vegetarian. Technically, plant-based does not necessarily mean plant-exclusive, right? It just means based. But these days, people use vegan and plant-based interchangeably. But technically, it does not have to mean vegan. What do you love most about being vegan? Ah, so it's interesting because there are two things. In thinking about that, I get asked that actually quite a bit. And I love the question, by the way, because many people, I would say most people ask what's the challenge, and that's approaching it from a sense of lack. So I love that you asked what I love about it first. So what I love about it is that I love food, and I'm a true foodie, and the food's delicious. And I think it would have been a struggle for me to be vegan if I didn't eat good food. Like I literally will travel to another state or another country to eat good food. That's how much I love to eat. <laughs> so what do you eat during the day? So what are like, what's your breakfast? What's your lunch? What's your dinner? Do you do it that way? What are your snacks? What do you eat? It just depends. When I'm at home for breakfast, I make a fruit smoothie or a green smoothie or oatmeal with chopped nuts and chopped fruit. For lunch, I may have a wrap and a salad. I may have a burrito. I may have pasta with a stir fry. For dinner, I may make, one of my favorite dishes is a sauté collard greens with sun-dried tomatoes and garlic over curry quinoa. 
And I might mm. have some curry chickpeas with that, you know, mm. so at home I'm pretty simple, but if I'm having a dinner party, you know, or just some friends over to eat or family members, I'll usually make lasagna or a pot pie or a quiche, something, you know, a little more fancy. Sounds good. Sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. And my other favorite thing about being vegan is that it makes me feel free. And I literally mean that because I know what to eat as a vegan. I know how to eat healthfully and have been doing it for so long. I don't have guilt around the food that I eat. And I know that it's helping the planet. I know that it helps decrease hunger. The more people who eat plant based foods, the fewer farmed animals that are fed soy and corn and wheat and other grains that are fed to animals, if those foods were given to people and people could consume them, we would decrease world hunger. So there's fulfillment and freedom in that too. You know, a lot of people believe that being vegan means being restricted, but I feel exactly the opposite. I don't feel deprived. I actually feel more free. That makes a lot of sense. You created a program that will officially launch in the fall called 10,000 Black Vegan Women. And so what inspired you to create this program for Black women and why is it so important? What inspired me to create it was actually the 10th anniversary of my first book by Any Greens Necessary. So I wrote that in 2010 and that was the first vegan diet book for Black women and helped thousands of women go vegan. And so for the 10th anniversary, I wanted to do something big and celebratory. And so I came up with this idea to help 10,000 Black women go vegan in one year, something that's really bold, something that's doable and something that's necessary because... We are leaders in the vegan movement, leaders in so many progressive ways, but for a variety of reasons, primarily uh, systemic white supremacy, oppression in this country. And we see that magnified. We see that in stark relief with COVID-19, right? People who have pre-existing conditions are experiencing the worst outcomes from this pandemic you know, and Black women experience the worst health outcomes for these reasons. And so it's really important, even more urgent than ever, for us to take back control of our health while we are also doing the work of dismantling this unjust system. Simultaneously, we need to take care of ourselves as well. And eating a healthy plant-based diet is the most effective way to regain control of our personal health. So what does the program look like? We are going to do 21 day vegan fresh start. So it's an online program that will start in the fall. Every month through the end of the year, we're going to run 21 day fresh start. So there'll be cooking videos, a meal plan, done for you grocery shopping list, recipes, and an online community. And I'll be doing webinars, teaching nutrition 101, so that people really understand how and why to do it, how to make it affordable, convenient, and delicious. That sounds amazing. How do people sign up for it? They can go to 10,000blackveganwomen.com. All the information is there. I guess by choosing to work with Black women, then you're hopeful that that might change the trajectory of families and their health and then impact the husband or the spouse or the men in some way. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we know that women are still primarily responsible for food, for health in the household. And so absolutely, when you are able to help women, you're helping the entire family. You're also helping the community, the neighborhood, the social group, whether it's a faith-based organization, work relationships they have, women share this information. When they're able to have self-transformation, they want to share that. And so absolutely, we impact other people. And particularly if women are mothers, I have yet to meet a woman who doesn't want to raise healthy children. So this absolutely impacts the children and may change the health paradigm of that family. Do you think this pandemic has led people to become more healthy now and more conscious of what they're eating? And if so, how do you think the plant-based diet fits into this? I do. I mean, in the beginning of it, people were asking questions all the time about how to boost immunity, right? And my answer was always, you can't boost immunity for the short term. Your immunity is based on how you regularly eat. It's cumulative, right? So you can start now and do things 
so that if and when this happens again, you will be better prepared, you will be healthier, right? But just the fact that people were asking that question, they actually were thinking about their health, as they should. But I think for the long term, people are really going to come out of this and want to be healthier for the long term. That's what I see. Yeah, we really agree. And one thing that we were talking about, too, is to be healthy so you don't have to worry about becoming healthy. Right. And how can you embrace that lifestyle and live it every day? So it sounds like your program will help people take steps in that direction. That's the goal. Absolutely. Is it hard to be on a plant-based diet? And how do you transition if you're an omnivore and you're thinking about being a vegan? Well, most people don't transition overnight. That's very rare. There are a couple of steps. But the first thing is to know why you want to do it, because there are going to be tremendous obstacles that you face. And so I always say to work backwards from there, make the decision that you are going to go vegan. And if that takes you a month, if that takes you six months, if that takes you a year, it's okay. It's not a race. It's not a comparison. It's your journey. But you have to be solid in the foundation so that when you slip up because you're going out to eat or you're going to a family gathering, most people take two steps forward and then they might eat cheese, right? Or then they might eat eggs and something, fish sauce and something. It's not the end of the world. You still have this goal and you're just working towards it. And a lot of times that takes a lot of education of yourself, just a lot of reading, a lot of watching videos, watching documentaries. That's the first thing. After that, figure out what are your typical nine meals that you eat? Most people have nine meals that they rotate, right? What are those meals? And how can you veganize them? What can you substitute? Start there. As opposed to starting something completely new, starting with what you already know how to do and just add vegan substitutions. When I was growing up, and Tricia too, it was always, you need to have your protein. And so, if, <laughs> you know, make sure to get your protein if you're playing sports or whatever. So how, as a vegan, do you get your protein? All plant foods have protein in them in varying amounts, even an avocado and an apple and a vegetable. You know, dark leafy greens have small amounts of protein. So there are foods that have higher amounts, beans, lentils, nuts, and there are hundreds of beans in the queendom, right? And then there are burgers. There are vegan versions of things that you can also use as transition foods that have plenty of protein. So it's actually quite easy to get enough protein. What I tell people is that we now have research to see how much protein folks are getting. And what the research has shown is that most people, whether they're omnivore, vegan, or vegetarian, get 70% more protein than the recommended daily allowance. So if you're eating a healthy vegan diet, now I'm not saying that your chips and Coke, you know, that's vegan, right? But if you're eating a healthy, well-balanced diet, like you may have been conscious of doing as an omnivore, if you're eating a well-balanced diet as a vegan, it's almost impossible not to get enough protein. It's really a non-issue. Tracy, what do you say about things we're labeling ourselves? Like, how do you feel about that? Like, I'm labeling myself a vegan, or I'm labeling myself a vegetarian, or I'm labeling myself an omnivore. It's different because when I started 33 years ago, we were all vegetarian, right? And then under that, you were a vegan, or you were lacto-ovo, or you were ovo, or you were lacto, or you were fruitarian. So there were actually more labels back when I started. And now everything is plant-based or vegan or vegetarian. Like there are not a lot of categories. The categories that actually have changed are the omnivore category. So now you can be pescatarian or flexitarian, reducitarian. And that all says to me that people are wanting to go more towards a plant-based diet. I don't have a problem naming things. I think that the default is omnivore and people don't even know that that is a label. You're like a fish in water. It's not until you change your diet that you then become labeled. But you are something. You have chosen to eat a certain way and to be a part of a certain culture. You just start labeling yourselves. But that is something also. I think naming things is important. I think what you're saying, too, is it kind of gives you a roadmap. It kind of says, okay, I've made this decision for myself based on these goals, or this is what's important to me. Number one being my health. Number two, the health of the world and the environment, that sort of thing. Absolutely. And you've written a couple cookbooks. 
I have. How does that go? Like when you write a cookbook, is it like, oh, I love this recipe and then you fool around with it or how does that go? Well, the first book, By Any Greens Necessary in 2010 was really a manifesto. So that had about 40 something recipes. Really, it was more content about how and why. The second book I wrote in 2018 called Ageless Vegan with my mother, who went vegan with me 33 years ago. And so we were writing it at the time to celebrate our 30th vegan anniversary. And so it was 100 recipes. And it was easy to choose the recipes because they were 100 of our favorite recipes, right? So after 33 years, we have a lot. (laughs) The challenge was that we didn't write these things down. Right. So we had to create the recipes and get some professional help. I had no idea how much work it would take to come up with a hundred really doable, simple recipes that other people could duplicate. My hat's off to people who do this for a living because it's a lot of work. It sounds like your mom was ahead of her time and she was a great role model for you. So it's no wonder that you're launching this program to help other women. How important are women role models? Such a good question. Thank you. Yes. I mean, it's just so important. My mom really was ahead of her time. And and also in terms of being a womanist or a feminist, she was ahead of her time in a lot of ways. And I think that that's part of the reason why it wasn't hard for me emotionally and mentally to go against the grain 33 years ago to say I'm going to do this even though no one else in my circle at Amherst was doing it that I knew about. Even the school didn't have regular vegan meals. I had to fight with the dean about that. You know, she ingrained that. I'm the youngest of three daughters and we were confident about ourselves and our stances. My mother definitely planted that seed in me and my sisters as well. So yes, absolutely role models are important. I mean, one of my sisters went vegan too. So the three of us were doing it together these three decades. But if you don't have that, seek it out. There are so many online communities, so many veg groups, meetup groups in local communities that you really don't have to go it alone. So if you don't have that person, that sibling, that family member, that close friend who wants to go vegan with you, know that you are worth it. You can do it anyway and find your own support. Very important. No one should feel that they have to go through this alone. That's why I think your online program is going to be so effective because you've got everybody doing it together and you leading them, which is pretty awesome. Thank (laughs) you for joining us and sharing all of this information with us. Thank you for having me on. And I just want to really encourage people to check out the program and to sign up. It's free. And just to understand that what I'm really trying to do is change the health paradigm of Black women. That's a monumental task, but a very doable one. So spread the word and ask your friends and family to check it out. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doral. Be well.